Greetings, you death dragons of the apocalypse. I am Fraser, and you are listening to Until the Last Gasp Extreme Metal Podcast. If you want to get in contact with me, I'm on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Until the Last Gasp Podcast. You can also hear any previous episodes um, in the channel links and the description of this episode. This show is produced by P-Noise Productions. If you're after any uh, audio production needs or podcast production needs, look them up at P-Noise Productions, spelled P-N-O-I-Z-E. Also, I am now uploading to Beansprout, Spotify, YouTube, and Rumble. And if you would like to share and subscribe, that would be very much appreciated to help grow the channel. And thanks to everyone who tuned in last week when I interviewed Morbid Maginan Desade from Invocation. Just a quick reminder that I do have about 20 or so copies of the CD for Hastur, which I've done the reissue of. Um, there's also some signed copies. There's about seven of those left as I speak over at my Bandcamp page, which is Until the Last Gas podcast over on Bandcamp. So if you're after one of those, go check them out because we're getting down to the very last numbers of those. And today we are looking over the pond from Australia to look into the career full of iron blood and blasphemy of America's truly great beast, Angel Corpse. So let's get into that. Angel Corpse was formed in Kansas City, Missouri in 1995 by Pete Helmkamp after the breakup of his influential extreme metal band Order from Chaos. Helmkamp, along with guitarist Gene sorry, Palubicki, would recruit drummer John Longstreth and they would, in early 1996, round out a lineup that would record their first demo titled Goats of Azazel. Uh, that was released in 1996, which led to the band signing with French-based label Osmos Production for their very first record, Hammer of Gods. Angel Corpse would enter Chapman Recording and Mastering in Lenexa, Kansas to record their revered debut album, Hammer of Gods. It was recorded between July and August of 1996. The lineup for that was Pete Helmkamp on vocals and bass, Gene Palubicki on guitars, and John Longstruth on drums. It was produced and engineered by Ken Polakovich. I'm pretty sure that's how it's pronounced. Uh, it was mastered by Jim Morris, co-produced by Angel Corpse, Photography was done by Mikai Tepesh and Joe Devil Craig did their logo. The cover artwork was taken from a painting called The Triumph of Death, painted by Peter Bruegel Bruegel in the 1500s. Released on the day of Halloween in 1996, it went for nine tracks, running for a total of 38 minutes and eight seconds. The track listing for this one was number one, Consecration, number two, Envenomed, Number three, When Abyss Winds Return. Number four, Lord of the Funeral Pyre. Number five, Black Solstice. Number six, The Scapegoat. Number seven, Soul Flayer. Number eight, Perversion Enthroned. And number nine, Sodomy Curse. When Abyss Winds Return. production on this record with its punchy mids is something similar to what you would expect from Morbid Angel, and with riffs and solos that almost verge on complete homage to Altars of Madness, it's easy to see who the biggest influence musically, at least at this point for Gene, I would think, at this time was for the band. The opening riff instantly reminds me of Chapel of Ghouls, but where Dave Vincent would bellow out his Opening note with these really large guttural vocals, Pete Helmkamp sounds something like he would have had imported directly from a release in Norway's black metal scene around the 1993 phase, very raspy and barky vocals. Anyone who needs a point of reference and hasn't listened to Angel Corpse, I would guess you'd say it would be something more akin to like Abath of Immortals kind of vocal delivery. Um, and for anyone that really wants that kind of no frills, charge ahead brutality, and for those of us that really like our metal that way, um, if you do it with such burning vitriol as these guys did, it was just phenomenal and straight out the gate for a first record. This was really oh, top-notch shit. Lord of the Funeral Pyre. No deviation or formula for the start of this one. Again, we're swept up in the trim peak death metal riffs backed by solid artillery drumming, that really pulsing bass line. They're really incredibly audible on this one. It's almost a mix, something akin to like a motorhead with the levels of bass on this. 
Uh, the solos here are just ripped through the mix as well. The note frenzies, heavy whammy bar use. Well, not on the next level of like a Trey Azagoth. They're very effective and work well to keep the vicious energy of the song continually on the move. At around 2 minutes 40, we get a section that really has a strong black metal feel to it, almost a folky swing to it, almost, uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess, albeit sped up, I would guess you would say, a really sped up kind of folky black metal riff. Um, not around long, though, as we go back to the kind of bread and butter that finishes this song as it started with just another chaotic solo, another great song to check out. Black Solstice. On an album with fast songs trying to outrun each other on how fast they can charge through verses, this one really feels like they've kind of geared up again. Um, but where you get to this middle, it has this brilliant chunky riff that's so simple, it's flawless. I wish they played it over a few more times, but speed is the name of the game here. And this song reaches its runtime end and what feels quicker than the actual three, three minutes and 50 seconds it was, yeah. Um, this song is wild and I defy anyone, in, I won't say where it is, but once you're listening to those riffs, there's a riff in here that sounds like it's almost lifted from Immortal Rights. Not exact, I guess, but it's so incredibly similar. But this still is a great song, and it was a monstrous debut record that would only really set a baseline in the levels of extremity and brutality for this band. So definitely far more things of like brutality, speed even, just incredible speeds that they would get to next. And this was a benchmark that they kind of set for themselves and would just continually outperform. Angel Corpse would recruit second guitarist Bill Taylor and head up to Tampa, where the band would eventually move in 1998. They would record their second album titled Exterminate between October 27th and November 7th of 1997 at Morrisound Studios in Florida. The lineup for this new record, Exterminate, would be Pete Helmkamp on vocals and bass, Bill Taylor on guitars, Jim Palabiki on guitars, and John Longstruth on drums. It was produced by Angel Corpse. Jim Morris did the recording and mastering. Aaron Manigan did the photography. Joe Pentagno did the cover artwork. And Pete Helmkamp did any additional artwork for this one. It was released in 1998 with eight tracks that ran for a total runtime of 39 minutes and 50 seconds. The tracks on this one were number one, Christ Hammer. Number two, War Torn. Number three, Into the Storm of Steel. Number four, Fallelujah. Number five, Reap the Whirlwind. Number six, That Which Lies Upon. Number seven, Embrace. And number eight, Sons of Vengeance. Christ Hammer. No warning shots on this album. The very first note of this song is flying into an unyielding assault of blast beats and riffs that let you know that the last record was just a measured doling out of the Hellfire Brew. By comparison, Exterminate and Christ Hammer would be more like being tied to a chair and funnel-fed molten steel all the while the anvils of Hell's Forges rang out in your ears. Merciless and uncompromising, with each riff that bursts from your speakers, clocking in at nearly six minutes, you can't help but be impressed by the levels of effort that goes into making and performing a song as just relentlessly aggressive as this one. Into the Storm of Steel. The song has all the hooks and riffs taken from under the hood of a band like Creator and then supercharge them to install inside of a death machine. There's really nothing here that deviates from any formula they've set before, but I'd say this song is probably more simpler than most other songs on this record. Uh, the riffs are so damn good, though, they just demand your head to move, and though this is one of the shorter songs on the record, it's a potent little bastard that you may want to chuck on for a second spin because it deserves repeated listens. This is a monstrous thundering skull crusher of a song with riffs that 
wildly changed between hulking bulldozers to wildly running through machine gun fire. Ferocious in every meaning of the word, and the speed of those double kicks at times borders on in, it just inhuman tempos. Just keeping the jumping up during riffs you think you're already pushing into ridiculous, they just top themselves every time and keep finding that extra gear to shift up into just the ludicrousness of how fast and heavy you can go. This song is a masterpiece of speed and menacing riff crafting that has seen many emulators left wanting, really. This record was the next step in a sound that already had all the bite to go with the bark and Angel Corpse was quickly gaining ground as a band with the skill and chops to stand shoulder to shoulder with the greats of the death metal scene. Shortly after the recording of Exterminate, drummer John Longstreth left the group. In an interview with Pete Helmkamp, it was said that Longstreth's drumming was quote, entirely inadequate live and that his lack of will had become a constant thorn in our side. He would also state that his disappearance was long overdue Longstreth was replaced by Tony Loreno, formerly of Acheron. I was told that when I pronounced Acheron, I was wrong, so I do apologize if it is Acheron. And also, I did mention that in the episode of uh, Abramelin, which I've also been told is meant to be pronounced Abramelin. So um, I'm not sure 100% on those, but I'm guessing I am entirely wrong on those, so I do apologize because I mispronounce a lot of shit. But anyway, Helmkamp told the interviewer that Lorano had been a big influence on the band. He is an incredible drummer, and with his skills, there is no limit to what we can accomplish. After a run of a European and American shows, Bill Taylor would also leave the band. Helmkamp would state that although Taylor remained a good friend of the band, he could just not keep up as far as the speed was concerned, particularly with the new material, and that they wished him all the best of luck for the future. Taylor was replaced by a session rhythm guitarist named Steve Bailey for the follow-up tour in the United States. And so with a new drummer, Angel Corpse would enter the studio in Morris Sound again, to record their third album titled The Inexonerable. Guitarist Gene Palobicki said that the band had chosen that title because it had a really ominous sound, plus it means relentless, merciless, unforgiving and unyielding. So he thought that would really work and it fit good. Pete Helmkamp was back on this one for the vocals and bass. Same with Gene Palobicki on guitars and Tony Loreno on drums. Jim Morris was also back for mixing and mastering, and Robin Mazin did the photography, Bruce Venegas and Terry Mochizuki did photography and live photography, and Joe Pentagano also was back for doing cover art. This was released on September 6, 1999, with eight songs running a total of 34 minutes and 29 seconds. Track listing for this record was number one, Storm Gods Unbound, number two, Smoldering in Exile, Number three, Reaver. Number four, Wolf Lust. Number five, As Predator to Prey. Number six, Solar Winds. Number seven, Be Gone Through Blood and Flame. And number eight, Fall of the Idols of Flesh. Storm Gods Unbound. You'd be hard-pressed to try and find, write, or even (laughs) conceive an opening song that could compete with the sheer brutality of the previous album opener, Christ Hammer. And yet, with Storm Gods Unbound, this is exactly, while not as wild in its riff changes, it is blisteringly fast from start to finish. And the drumming performance on this is just amazing in its execution and its speed, It's probably faster than any other song they'd done previously. Uh, Once again, the goal was speed, and this time they'd managed to raise the bar once again on that for themselves. And as a result, well, those results really do speak for themselves. Subject yourself and kneel before the storm gods and pray you don't get crushed under the weight of this beast. It is a blisteringly fast, brutal song. Definitely check this one out. Wolf Lust. Wolf Lust is probably one of their most popular and well-known songs. The riffs on this one are so incredibly catchy. Um, 
As far as with this record, it's probably the most that they go to in a sense of some kind of level of, I guess you would say, Morbid Angels mid to late 90s commerciality sound. The riffs are just so well-crafted. You could almost expect this to have a video if it wasn't such an underground band. Um, Performances on this one by all members, once again, just so incredibly well done. The writing of this knowing where to pull back to just have those completely catchy punchy riffs the eat fuck kill chant which live they would just draw out and it was just such a well crafted song for a live set this one has been thrashed to death many times and oh my god there's nothing they've got like this in anything else they've done you have to witness this one to understand how incredibly potent this was As predator to prey. The triplets in this opening riff uh, must be acknowledged. They're tight, brutal. You could loop it for days. Uh, luckily, it uses this again in the solo section at around the 330 mark because it absolutely kicks ass. And the opening riff is a world beater and a thing of disturbed beauty. This record is so consistent and fast that they've really not got more than a few riffs that kind of tap the brakes a bit on this and we get a few that comes noticeable when they do, so they better be damn good and fortunately they are. So this song that follows Solar Winds also has to be checked out just because it's an absolute speed demon of another level. But again, some disorienting tapping riffs that hit the spot and the overall Wow, this record is just another flawless one in a trilogy that's got to get more praise because there is few bands that can get so much right and get faster and heavier with each release without hitting the ceiling after their first outing. The doers that followed the Inexonerable were ill-fated and would cause the end of the band at least for some time. Pete Helmkamp was injured when their van was involved in a road accident and on that very same tour, Pete's girlfriend was stabbed and as a result, he decided to leave the band. The rest of the members would make an attempt to continue, but ultimately they decided to split up the band. A compilation of covers and singles was released around the time of 2001 titled Iron Blood and Blasphemy, and which for a little trivia was my very first ever death metal and Angel Corpse record. I bought it when I was in early high school. So this is a real spot, soft spot for me. This record, a live album also titled Death Dragons of the Apocalypse was released in 2002, but Angel Corpse would be over for this point. After several years, Polobiki and Helmkamp got back together and began working on new material. They also brought formerly ousted drummer Longstreth back into the band and reunited the original lineup that would record the follow-up to the inexorable titled of Lucifer and Lightning, which was released in 2007. Polobiki told Schwartz that the band's approach to death metal emphasised a stronger mix of of ideas with songs, however, that Angel Corpse had no intention of ever changing their sound to include distinctly less aggressive elements like keyboards or female vocals, or particularly melodic or harmonic guitar solos. Helm Camp had said the band's signature sound is over-the-top hellish mayhem. That is what defines Angel Corpse, a lack of parameters, a denial of limits, speed, endurance, agility, the elements that must be extolled. While still very much the band's core sound of Lucifer and Lightning was released to fairly mixed reviews, largely due to its production. Pete Helmkamp was once again back for bass and vocals, Gene Palobicki was back for guitars, and John Longstreth was returning for drums. Greg Marchak, who did the engineering and recording for this record, sadly passed away on September 7th, 2007, of a brain aneurysm. Brett Portzer did the recording of the drums, Bob Pomeroy did photography, M. Vaux did photography, and Jean, or Jean, or Jean Pascal Foriner did the artwork. It was released on May the 4th, 2007, with nine tracks running for a total of 36 minutes and 16 seconds. The tracks for this one were, number one, Credo Decimatus, or, which is an instrumental, number two, Antichrist Vanguard, number three, Machinery of the Cleansing, Number four, Hex and Sabbat. Number five, Extermination Sworn. Number six, Saints of Blasphemy. Number seven, Thrall. 
number eight, Shining One Rex Luciferi, and number nine, Lust Maud. Antichrist Vanguard. Great song that along with many other songs on this record suffers from muddy and somehow at the same time thin production. All the core Angel Corps elements were here and intact and while at this point in their career you were going to be asking a really tall order to have these guys outdo their previous three records on speed or brutality, Antichrist Fan Card is a great opening song that has all the hooks and noticeable songwriting flair to hold its own. If only it wasn't as so comparably lacking in the production department. The bass, the bass guitar is almost non-existent in this mix and the drums are more like taps instead of a storm of artillery that we used to get. Still, if you can get past that really kind of thin production, there's enough meat on the bones of this as far as songwriting to really make this a great addition to their live set at least. Um, but yeah, we do really need to have something done about the production on this one. I think this one would be really well done. It served to have a remaster. Exxon Sabbath. An absolute juggernaut of a riff opens this song. And there's technical riffs that are spread out over this that are so incredibly well crafted and are complete, aim w complete earworms that they're just completely unshakable in your head. The solos in this one sound like they've been played through a tiny hand radio, though, which kind of takes away from the chaos and the wild feel that they once had. But again, this is another song that when they play it live, it would take on a life of its own. I can only hope that these sessions of the recordings are still around so that we might be able to get these ones polished up a bit more, give these songs the treatment that they so desperately deserve. This is one hell of a great song with some really out of the box riffs that sound fresh to the Angel Corp sound and they just thrashed these triplets with such a magical way. Even in their sound, there were still unexplored nooks, and such gems as this were unearthed from there. It's just when it backs off on that unbridled speed to allow more sinister brooding sound to spill out, much like Morbid Angels' Blessed, of the, Blessed Are the Sick or a few of the tracks of Heretic, I think the shit this record gets for its production is kind of agreeable to some degree, but... If I'm being honest, the songs on this record really stand up and can exceed expectations. Multiple listens of this record are definitely a must. You kind of need to acclimatize yourself to the sound of this record so that you can listen with what you're hearing and appreciate what it is being written and what potential it could have had with that decent, pol yeah, decent polish, I guess you would say. But there was definitely no slouches for songs on this one. This was a really competent record. But as again in 2009, Angel Corpse would once again call it a day and return to its slumber only once more to return in 2015 for a final tour run to celebrate the 20 year anniversary of the band. This final run would, as they stated, not be for any releasing of new material, but was a final send off for the band, which had managed to get an Australian tour. Lucky enough for me, I did finally get to see them. Unfortunately, Gene wasn't there. But hey, beggars can't be choosers, and it was a phenomenal set. The band would come to its final resting place in 2017, and Pete and Gene would go to work on their individually, on their own projects. Um, Pete was in uh, Ad Homin and Carissa Forest, I think it's pronounced, and Gene to continue with Perdition Temple. Could they return for this decade and shock us all once again? I mean, I guess anything's possible. I am incredibly hopeful as they are a god tier band as far as I'm concerned. And if you disagree, that's all right. People are wrong every day and they have no ill fate befalling them. And you're more than welcome to join those ranks if you choose to do so. But otherwise, as for all that we have discussed today, that is all we have for Angel Corpse. This week, I'm going to have a late look into a release from last year. This was released back in March and 
was recently brought to my attention. This album is called Philosophine by the band Haysom, a one-man melodic black death metal project from Ukraine released by Satanath Records. All the instruments and vocals are handled by Andre Tolok. I hope I've pronounced that right. Uh, this record has a great balance of melodic and dissonant elements. In the riffs, I found to be really engaging. There's a great balance of folk and traditional metal elements that run throughout the sections of this record that very rarely do they feel out of place. I guess there's some more rocky segments in there. Well, not entirely bad, just not wholly in keeping with the atmospheres. Though I will say that there's interludes here that kind of are a bit out of place, but for the most part, there's some fairly well-balanced struck here in the structure to balance out these kind of elements in the songwriting I could be wrong here, but at times I do get the feeling that this record has taken inspiration from like bands kind of around like Abgot, early, early Dimmu Borgir and Old Man's Child, uh, maybe even some late era behemoth. Um, bands like of that ilk, I guess you would say, with a few deviations and folk-like elements to balance out those sounds so it's not completely ripping those off. I just kind of get that feeling. with, And especially being a one-man band, there's some great performances and brilliant songwriting on here. The production on this record is very high-end, an extreme metal scene that's sometimes viewed as a bad thing, but I definitely think the polish is struck well on this one to kind of keep it sounding more aggressive and not sterile, but it definitely has that kind of a black and death polish that you would come to expect from the melodic death metal sound. Uh, it does help as well when bounding back and forth between the black metal dissonance and the mellow death to not have it absolutely saturated in waspy distortion or in reverb. So overall, this record was a really well-balanced and spread out listen that didn't drop all of its elements early and dredge them back over and over again, as you sometimes do get within solo and one-man projects. Uh, I would recommend you listen to this one if you're a fan of bands with a decent level of folkish black metal and melodic death metal elements with a high-end production, something you would kind of credit to like a Dan Swano level of production, though Dan Swano is not on here. That's purely just a reference point. I want to make that clear. This one may not be for purists or elitists, but I found this to be a great weekend listen over the holiday break, just kicking back, lounging around with a few beers. Uh, my favorite tracks on this one were An Inspiration for My Inner Carnifex, Gore Painted Vacuum, and Despising the Infidels. If you want to find this album, check the links for this episode, as I will post a link to the Bandcamp one for this. But come back next week, as I am going to try something new, give people a bit of a, a breaking through of my grey matter to see what I think of discographies. So... I've seen a lot of people do their ranking of discographies and I'm prepared to throw my hat into that ring too and open myself up to all manner of criticisms, especially with who I'm going to start with. I'm going to discuss and rank the albums from the almighty Bathory, who are one of my personal favorite bands of all time. So get your knives at the ready for that one. But until then... As always, stay safe, play it loud, and support metal until the last gasp. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.